Okay, so uh, welcome on our session. My name is uh, Jakub Pavlík. Uh, I am former CTO of TCP Cloud, who actually started to do the implementation in uh, Tieto. And during the time, uh, Mirantis acquired TCP Cloud. So now we are delivering Mirantis OpenStack there. And my position now is director of product uh, engineering or platform. And I am here today with uh, Lukáš Kubín. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lukáš Kubín from Tieto. Uh, I work with, as a cloud architect in Tieto for the OpenStack services we are doing. Uh, and this is, a, this is a use case story. So we will talk about the experience we had by deploying the, what actually the guys from TCP Cloud did. Uh, and our experience so far, and, uh, and we will also uncover some plans we are, uh, we are having together for the, for the next uh, development. So, uh, first, I would like to say something about Tieto, for, for those who, who might not be familiar with. Uh, so, Tieto is the major IT services provider in North European countries. Uh, it is, it is delivering the services to, to healthcare, government, financial services, industries, um, and is, um, is one of the biggest, or perhaps the biggest IT services provider in the, in the market. Uh, we aim to become the customer's first choice for, for digitalization and also for all the, all the type of cloud services. The turnover of the Eto Corporation is around one and a half a billion uh, euro. Uh, and, uh, and the shares are listed on the, on the stock markets in Helsinki and, and uh, Stockholm. Uh, so where we have started, um, when I get back to the last year, uh, during last year, the theater was offering uh, publicly the services and cloud services uh, based on the infrastructure as a, as a service uh, concept. Uh, running on, on VMware platform and also, uh, also typical physical hosting services uh, and some, some very unique services like, for example, SAP hosting dedicated for, um, for running uh, SAP application in a standardized way and delivering, uh, delivering them to the cloud. What was missing in this port portfolio, however, uh, was, a, was a shared hosting service uh, for the horizontally scalable applications. So something for the cloud native applications to be delivered from, from the theater data centers uh, was missing. And um, I must say that even the time talking about the year 2015, we have been working in that time internally for some, some two years uh, on evaluation as most of other companies did the internal evaluation of, of OpenStack, like, yeah, like to, to recognize what that, uh, what that new kind in the, on the market um, might, be, might be useful for. So in that time, we have been evaluating the, um, and running actually in, in internal development systems, uh, Havana and Icehouse releases. And actually, a couple of those uh, environments uh, are still running, uh, used for some internal development. Uh, in 2016, uh, <clears throat> we have started building officially, uh, pub, uh, let's, let's say, uh, production workload and production service uh, to, the, to the customers. So it was no more development, it was, it was the end user service offered to the Eto customers uh, running on top of OpenStack and running on top of TCP Cloud OpenStack. And, uh, we will tell you something more about the journey which was leading to this. So, when doing the evaluation, we have set some we have set some targets to uh, to fulfill uh, and some requirements uh, we had on the, uh, on the on the OpenStack environment and uh, on the infrastructure to be able to deliver the services. It was of course that we would like to avoid any any kind of vendor lock-in. Uh, we know that we can't totally uh, avoid any kind of uh, vendor locking, but by using open source, uh, we can at least keep a lot of control in our hands and keep, keep us in our hands the flexibility of, of, uh, of change of the, of, of the vendors. Uh, we needed the seamless on-demand capacity expansion to, to be able to um, independently scale on, the, uh, on all the infrastructure levels, both the networks and storage systems and compute nodes and, 
and all that kind of, of scaling. Uh, infrastructure as a code was something uh, we realized later uh, that was actually our requirement. So I will, I will start now with our beginnings. Uh, when I told you that we have started some internal activities around OpenStack uh, around the years of 2013 or in the, in the OpenStack release words, it was the time of Havana and Icehouse. Uh, in that time, what we were testing was uh, where the, mm, what we now tend to call installer type distributions. So we were dealing with Packstack, RDO, uh, with the fuel, um, and these type of distros, which um, were quite easy uh, to learn, easy to deploy on the, on the infrastructure. And it was easy for us to jump in and, and start doing something with the OpenStack. Yeah? We, we, we get the OpenStack environment running quite, quick and quite quickly. And uh, yeah, in that time we were the happy guys seeing the first pink packets yeah, coming, uh, coming from one virtual machine to the other one via the overlay and we wondered why and how that happened and we were running the TCP dumps to see how, the, how that's possible that the GREs are really transferring through all these layers from one server to, to another one. Then the things. Uh, started to complicate slightly uh, when we started to think how to push this, uh, this environment into the production and how to, how to let it uh, manage by, by more people. Uh, uh, and we realized that uh, the installer type distributions are focused mainly to, uh, to deploy the environment, but don't give us much support uh, in the way how to manage the, uh, the, the environments in the, in the other, uh, other days. Uh, they usually use something like the single flat file where we set all the, all the initial parameters, all the IP addresses and, and options, configura configuration options for the initial setup, uh, but didn't allow us to, to do multiple level of configuration, something like mm, we, might, we might call it configuration tiering eh, or layering. Uh, let's say that we would like to configure um, a, a group of compute nodes for some purpose and another group of compute nodes for another particular reason. That's something which was, which was not feasible using these single configuration files, for example. So that, that's, that's one experience we had with these distros. And actually, any, uh, any deviations to, uh, to this prescribed way of configurations were uh, quite hard to manage. Uh, Another thing we have realized um, doing, uh, doing this kind of working with this kind of distros uh, was that there is no way actually how to compare the status, um, uh, compare the status uh, of configuration which is running on the servers with the status uh, which is intended uh, by the administrator from the, from the initial deployment uh, as, as it is defined in the configuration files actually. Uh, we were not able to, when let, let, let's imagine that someone does a, a change in, uh, uh, in, in configuration files, in Nova Compute, for example, config file, and we would like to realize that there was some change done, uh, uh, which, is, which was not documented. There was no way how to, how to do this kind of configuration auditing, because there was no, uh, no, no version controlled repository of these of this configs, and a way how to, how to do the comparison of the configuration running and applied on the servers with something which is in the yeah, in the configuration template. Uh, also, a, a complication we were facing was that uh, we actually, it, it, this situation uh, resulted in the way that uh, we had to do most of the changes manually on the servers, and of course that's easy because we can, we can use some scripts which do some set replacement on the config files and issue some restart commands, uh, but uh, each of such changes during the time uh, needs to be documented somewhere. So we had to document each of such changes in some wiki page or some, some, some shared notebooks uh, to be able to reproduce these configuration changes later when, well, let's say, we decide to, to extend, the, uh, extend the system by another compute node. Uh, we would have to reapply all the changes we did on the previously deployed compute nodes on, on the other one also, and not to forget something. And uh, so that was a tough requirement to really be uh, that precise uh, to document all these kind of changes. 
in this environment. And we realized that this is a problem yeah, and that we have no, no tools how to, um, how to manage this. But still, uh, I'm noting that I'm talking about uh, development activities which were not yet uh, uh, focused on delivering a production service. Yeah, that, that, uh, that point and that decision came, came later. But we, that was part of our evaluation doing in that time. So, so the, this situation led uh, to a mixed configuration approach um, uh, when some of the changes were, uh, or some, some of the configuration was deployed from the initial deployment and some of the changes was done later by scripts and, and manual adjustments. Uh, and I was uh, visiting the OpenStack Summit in, in, since the since the Paris summit, I believe it was year 2013 or 14. 14. Yeah, and I could I could hear uh, I could hear guys still, uh, talking then about uh, yeah this continuous integration approach and continuous development and how to reproduce the developers uh, uh, developers processes and tool sets also on the infrastructure, but I couldn't find how. I could do that, yeah, because none of the distributions was doing there, that and uh, the guys talking about that on, on the summit in that time were mainly from the companies who had um, tens and hundreds of developers capable to, to do this and uh, they could employ them uh, to, to take vanilla OpenStack and, and fine tune it uh, to, to be able to apply this kind of configuration approach. Uh, so, when Later, the decision came, the, the, the company decided that we will build, build such an OpenStack service as a product, in, in a production and uh, we will offer it to the customers. We already knew and had some experience uh, what we would like not to follow. Yeah? It, was, it was just what I have, uh, what I have described. Uh, we were looking on the market then on the, on the OpenStack distribution still of this kind and uh, because we also uh, were dealing a lot of details like the software defined networking, we realized that open switch might be not enough for us uh, uh, to follow in the multi-tenant environment with a lot of external uh, customer dedicated connections. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the time in 2015 when we uh, came across uh, Jakub and, and the colleagues from, from TCP Cloud to the Emirantes uh, because they were very skilled and they are very skilled in, uh, in open control. Uh, and we thought that they could help us. Um, they could help us with the open control integration into whatever uh, OpenStack distribution we, we choose. Uh, very soon, we, however, realized that what guys are doing is exactly the fit and uh, and solution for for a lot of the problematic areas I have mentioned. That they are doing this configuration integration approach and, uh, and they store all the configuration in Git in in structured class config files uh, and so uh, we, we decided to go with TCP Cloud for, as, a, as a provider of the distribution for, uh, for the OpenStack environment. So the, the, the issues we have resolved by that was that we had an open source distribution because uh, the TCP Cloud uh, MK20 distribution is an open source. Uh, we fulfilled the automation uh, for all the uh, all the infrastructure management. What I have not yet mentioned and what was the trouble for us uh, of the installer type distribution is that they usually care only about the OpenStack part and uh, on the supportive services which are very close to OpenStack. So they care sometimes about the Galera, they, they care about HA proxy, but they don't care about much more. Uh, but for us as a service provider to, to operate the service, we need a lot more. We need uh, to have uh, a monitoring for all the infrastructure part. We need a log collection. We need a metrics collection uh, to support us with troubleshooting and root cause analysis. Uh, we needed that uh, SDN integration. Yeah, we realized that Contrail is yeah, one of the right solution, but it was not hard to find a distribution which uh, works correctly with, with Contrail, for example. So that we got from, uh, from, from boys from TCP Cloud, boys and girls, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so talking about that, uh, just a short uh, roadmap of the state where we have uh, started with this production efforts. It was 2015. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, it's about uh, 12 months now when we did the proof of concept installation. 
uh, with TCP cloud uh, um, distribution. And now we are running that in, in production in the, in the first uh, avail availability zone and we are now deploying the other availability zone. Uh, when talking about the networking, I mentioned that uh, it was a challenge for us because uh, uh, we got a lot of customers connected to our data centers. Uh, usually the customers are mm, using some dedicated lines, some VPN uh, connections terminated in, in theater data centers. And we needed to extend all of these customer networks um, to, the, to the OpenStack environment and, and to connect them only to that particular customers. And that was a task which was uh, um, practically impossible to, uh, to implement using the standard uh, open vSwitch based distribution and, uh, and network model. We would have to deploy a, a, lot, of, a lot of network nodes dedicated to have uh, all, these, uh, all these external uh, networks connections. Uh, in that time, of course, uh, now the thumb, something might have moved, but I'm not following that, that, that carefully because I'm satisfied with what Open Contrail is doing for us. Yeah. So please don't blame me that Open vSwitch can do or cannot do something, uh, something particular. But in that time, that was, that was the case when we were evaluating. So we needed to ensure the high availability, this specific of this external connection, we needed the, so, um, the, the solution to be robust and to be able to talk to our edge routers because we deploy the OpenStack in so-called availability zones, uh, which contain all the, uh, all the, all the management, um, uh, management and control nodes with all the supportive features, and they are in dedicated pods. So all these dedicated pods are etched by a pair of physical routers, and these routers are connecting then to the external data center, uh, data center networks. Uh, and we resolved uh, a lot of these challenges with, with open contrail. We, we, had, uh, we had the SDN solution talking to our physical routers, which is very good for scaling and for interoperability uh, with the surrounding networks. Uh, we achieved a great performance on, on the networking level and um, uh, we had an open source based solution which is easily extendable. Uh, when troubleshooting for, for any particular bug, it's very easy for us now uh, to check, for example, where this DNS request might have some problem because it is not passing somehow and we can look into the, into the source code and identify the cause and, and, and ask someone to fix it or do it by ourselves, but we are not, not yet there. Uh, we usually ask Jakub and the team to, <laughs> to fix, uh, fix these things. Uh, and we also uh, chose the, uh, the, the open control based SDN solution because uh, we set it for us as a requirement that we will need some interoperability with the containers. Uh, we are not offering that kind of service yet, but we know that we will come in. Uh, we will need to come with that very soon and we wanted to build a solution which will be ready for, uh, for, for container support. Uh, which will be ready for um, bare metal deployments, for example, by supporting the OVSDB protocol to be able to, to talk to physical switches also uh, and, and these things. And we have found all this in, in open control. So the facts uh, where we are today, uh, now we are running this MK20 distribution. Uh, uh, we are running open control uh, 2.21. Uh, we are providing basically all the core, uh, core OpenStack services, Glance, Heat, uh, Nova, Compute. Uh, we are not running some uh, any, any more particular because we have focused on stabilizing uh, uh, the, the core services and then we will come with the, with the additional. Uh, we are using Ceph as the software defined storage for, for the Cinder backend, uh, for the block storage level today. Uh, but we are evaluating uh, uh, all, flash, uh, all flash storage system, enterprise all flash storage systems to be offered as an additional, uh, additional storage tier to be, uh, to be back, uh, to be as another, uh, Ceph, uh, sorry, uh, to be, uh, to run as another Cinder backend. Yeah, these, these are uh, the, the tools that we are using, the mainly the product I have been talking about already. Uh, it's not important now to go into the details, it's just the overlay of, uh, of the management infrastructure. Uh, 
So all the all those small colored boxes are the uh, are the management machines. There are there are OpenStack controller nodes. There are dedicated database uh, Galera nodes serving as a backend for the OpenStack service databases. There are a lot of other databases for metrics storage and um, and silometer, for example, and some others. And uh, the reason why we do have this illustration here is to show the complexity of the of the management environment. Uh, on, on one side, it's it's a flexibility for us because as opposed to some uh, distribution which put all the stuff and all the tools on a single operating system on a single kernel running together, uh, we requested those to be isolated into the virtual machine running running on set of uh, managed nodes. Yeah, so all these uh, all these supportive features and control features are encapsulated in the virtual machines and running on top of uh, on top of uh, KVM hypervisor on managed nodes. But there are quite a lot of them to manage, even though that we have now the salt stack driven uh, um, deployment procedure which is stored in Git and we got a nice evidence of, of all the changes. Uh, we got a robust uh, infrastructure based on this now. Uh, and we have, uh, we have, uh, we have realized that there are some new challenges. Uh, actually, I must say that uh, with this distribution, uh, we have solved el all the troubles we had with the install type distributions. We have a very flexible configuration structure. Uh, there is no more a single flat configuration file where we need to prefill all the parameters and let, the, let it deploy and, and um, have no chance to, to modify it in, in some more detailed level. Now we can split it thanks to the reclass structure. We can we can create the levels of configuration for, for one type of compute nodes and other type of compute nodes. We can have a single configuration template for, for Linux operating system, for example. And we can even have one for uh, Ubuntu, which we are using for majority, and, and one for Red Hat, which we are using for the Ceph backend and some and identity management and some, uh, some other, um, other, other support features. So we can control the way how, how to deploy and, and manage the configuration of various services running together on these machines. That's, that's what we wanted. And we can, we can any time uh, compare the configuration and state on the, uh, on, on, the, uh, on, on the servers. And that's actually important to be able to do this comparison. Because uh, you can imagine it's, it's not only change of the technology to, to move from the classical manual administrative approach to this continuous integration yeah, approach. Because we are mostly admins. Yeah? Uh, I have spent um, most of my professional career doing some storage, uh, um, storage management and architecture. My colleagues are um, experienced in Linux administrators. Uh, and no one of us was any time working with, with developer tools, yeah, like like Git and uh, and the others. So uh, we had to uh, embrace and accept this developers uh, uh, this developers approach, and to be careful to really apply all the change, uh, store uh, each change in configuration file, put it into Git, read it, uh, read, uh, let it be reviewed. Uh, and then pulled back into our uh, our production repository, and then push by by salt to the configuration node. Uh, it's always uh, sorry to the to the managed nodes to the managed services. It's it's always tempting for us to ev <laughs> avoid this uh, this kind of change and to to do that something manually just to try how it works, but it's it's not the way. And uh, of course we have set ourselves a strict rules how how to work with this. Uh, and we, thanks to this type of approach, we have also a way how to, how to check that the systems are really configured as they are uh, intended to be. Yeah, because we can any time run the check which will compare uh, the configuration on the, on the nodes with the configuration which is stored in Git. And um, so I must say that, uh, yeah, there are, they are some challenges, but we are, we are satisfied what we are running. Uh, and what we see that can be uh, and should be improved yet uh, is, uh, is related to the structure of the, of the, of the management nodes and, and the configuration nodes. As, as I mentioned, it's over, I have counted it this morning, it's over 30 management VMs which, which are running some, uh, these, these control features and, and supportive features in each of the availability zones. 
Uh, and you can imagine those are over 30, uh, 30 operating systems which needs to be patched, which, uh, which needs to be maintained. Uh, there are a lot of uh, HA proxy to load balance any kind of, uh, uh, of virtual IP address, uh, which is providing the cluster, cluster features and uh, availability features for a lot of the OpenStack services. So there are a lot of HA proxies, a lot of keep lives, and a lot of additional services just to keep, keep this running. And that's, that's perhaps a, a management effort which can today be resolved by the, by the containerized approach. Yeah, and uh, that's the time when I should pass, pass the talk to, to Jakub uh, to talk us something about the architecture we are now planning to, to implement and uh, where we would like to move to. Yes, so as uh, Lukáš said, the, I will probably repeat my, several of my words from my yesterday session, but as he said, like the biggest issue here like that it's working, you can reproduce it, but uh, it takes some time uh, to build it. Because if when you have to spawn certain management VMs and run the states, it takes, let's say, uh, it can take two hours, but it can also take one day because of some mistake somewhere or mistake in the in the physical server and when you booting on, we have I think around six or seven physical nodes where we have all those 30 VMs just for managing the open stack. And uh, that's the problem yeah, because it's not flexible as it should be. And therefore yesterday I introduced the Mirantis Cloud platform now uh, which should cover uh, three types of workload. So it should provide uh, Kubernetes itself for the containers workloads. It should provide OpenStack on top of Kubernetes for, for virtual machines, for standard world. And we also want to provide bare metal provisioning through the, uh, through the Ironic. So what we are working on right now is that uh, we are building second data center on a new approach on uh, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. And uh, uh, we got a couple, uh, uh, couple of challenges. So um, let me show you how, it's, how it should look like. So we should have dedicated again four or five physical nodes for the controllers, but we will not have any more virtual machines or KVM inside and run uh, virtualized uh, Galera free nodes and Silometer free nodes and OpenStack API free nodes and RabbitMQ free nodes for the separation. But we will install on the host operation system just, uh, just free binaries uh, one is etcd for uh, Kubernetes, uh, one is um, uh, Hypercube binary, which manage uh, Kubernetes, and then we deliver uh, Calico as a, as a container. So basically, we, we touching host operation system only in uh, three ways, and uh, REST is delivered as, as a Docker containers and as a Kubernetes pods. So we label these five nodes in Kubernetes as uh, OpenStack controllers. And then we will provision in standard way just management of the network interfaces, OpenSSH, because we are registering all servers into uh, free API. And Kubernetes and REST will be launched by uh, kubectl start and we will start free Galera ports for the containers, uh, free ports for RabbitMQ, and then OpenStack and Open Control Services, which is pretty much flexible. And deployment, when you have physical servers with Kubernetes, took around five minutes. So we can, in five minutes, provision and delete the stuff. Because biggest difference here is that you don't have to download the packages. Even if you have validated configuration management tool, let's say Ansible, Salt, whatever, and you have packages, validated everything together, 
every time something broken. Like I've never seen the deployment where I press the button and something something was changed. Yeah, some access to repository or or package or something like that, and you have to rerun the whole state. The di the difference here that we are pushing uh, to the pre-builded Docker images as a binaries instead of packages, and they generating just the config files. Uh, for the uh, Nova Compute, uh, we delivering libvirt and Nova Compute as a, uh, as a containers in single uh, Kubernetes pod, and uh, vRouter for the open control is installed on uh, host operation system. So what's the, what's the difference here? Easily to explain is that today we have three VMs uh, with Keystone API, Glance API, Nova API, Cinder API. Inside we have HA proxy keep life D. So keep life D switching virtual IP address and HA proxy balancing. Uh, tomorrow, or what we are in the procedure right now is that we have Kubernetes service, which is simple IP table DNAT, which balance on free pods. It's much more faster and much more efficient. And uh, complexity and uh, mistakes are decreased because you don't have HA proxy and keep alive. Like even keep alive if stable, I saw several times something that system process was frozen or something like that, and we have to restart something. So this decreased the complexity of the of the balancing. For the mapping to imagine you how it's look, this is just one of the example for for uh, the environment that uh, in Kubernetes you have ports and ports share the uh, share the namespace, and it can be one or multiple containers. So for Glance or for Nova right now, we have single pod with multiple containers, and you scale this pod. Of course, for really large environment, we are also able to, for example, scale just Nova scheduler or scale just Nova conductor, and that's the huge benefit, because today you have free VMs, free services, and you have to scale by adding extra VM. Here I will just write number from three to four, run the Jenkins job, and he will auto scale in one minute and add me a new, new Nova conductor, just Nova conductor if I need it. Or I can scale it as the same way in VMs that I have everything tied together. Depends, uh, depends on the use case and scale of the, of the infrastructure. Um, so how looks the workflow? I also showed it yesterday. So you have a metadata model. And what's the important here? I think, yeah, I have a slide about metadata later, so I will explain later. So what's, what you are doing here, you are changing the YAML infrastructure. So let's say you want to upgrade component. So I will replace version from Liberty to Mitaka. I will do the git commit, git push into the get it. Someone from my team or, or Lukáš team check the review, approve it, and Jenkins will trigger update model on the Saltmaster. And Saltmaster just call Kubernetes, commit to deploy, which trigger auto scaling and rolling update or rolling update of the, of the container. And we have, in this case, Artifactory Docker registry os, is on the uh, Mirantis side. So it just downloads the new container from, uh, from, the, from the Mirantis downstream validated approved, approved container. And then it provides output back to the Jenkins job. Uh, who wants to see it live? I show it in session yesterday, so you, you can watch the live how how it uh, really work. But what's the what's the most important here is like um, uh, I discussed it like several times. So today, Tieto using like MK20 deployment, which is deployment based on reclass model, 
YAML structure, as Lukai said, that they have to change the YAML and push into the Git. And what's happened then, it calls SaltStack, which usually install package, do the change in the configuration, and then check the service. So this is like typical scenario in your standard world, what you are doing. But what we have here, we have Nova configuration files, uh, Cinder files, and all those kinds validated, and it's working and it's in production. So when we look how to build the MCP and how to generate uh, configuration files for the containers, we wanted to avoid way where I will have to maintain MK20, I will have to maintain new MCP, so let's imagine that someone wants to add some new parameter into NovaConf, so we have to go into MK20, add the parameter, and then go into the container, and someone do the mistake. So we took this model, and we are using exactly the same model for the VM deployment as for the containers. So customer can choose if he wants, for example, for whatever reason, take free bare metal servers and says, I want Galera here on these physical servers. I don't want to push it into containers. And the rest I want to launch on Kubernetes. And that's possible because we have single model, which consists like from four parts. So you are defining the bare metal servers. And then you are saying like roles in the YAML structure what they should have. So it's Kubernetes nodes, and it's OpenStack Kubernetes controller, which will run these services. And then you're defining parameters for your, uh, for your containers. So we have same model for, for both worlds, and we can cover transition from the both worlds very easily, because I can imagine that not every customer can tomorrow say like, I'm, I will be the containers because containers are cool and uh, someone in vendor told me that it should be containers. So this is not our way because we are trying to push the operation SLA supported model and not just cool stuff where someone says everything must be container and they delivering job which triggers something which change the kernel parameter or whatever. So this is like approach here, so we enable manage a host operation system by old way and launch containers by new way. The, the next advantage of the metadata model that we want to support multiple solution. So not one deployment as is usual, but let's support 100 clouds deployment for big customers. So you can have single model with branches so let's imagine you want to change CPU allocation ratio. Do the change in the YAML at new line, test it into test environment, and then apply into production environment just as a pull request or merge request uh, between the branches. So you have node level, service level, and um, a global level. So you can apply one change for your five clouds. Yeah? And still you're managing one stuff. So you are not touching the binaries, uh, you are not touching co Docker containers, because Docker container in our case is just binary. It's delivering instead of package. But you touching only one single repository where it's everything, it's auditable, and you see all your changes, and you can generate configuration, whatever you need, and that's the point. So for customer like Theato, there will no be difference between what they have today in, in way how they will approach it and what they will have tomorrow. Yeah, this is uh, uh, one of our last slides. This is a uh, uh, nice job of my team for the Horizon. So you can see how we customize the uh, Horizon for the, for the Theato mm -hmm. that uh, we added like billing feature and monitoring and everything into single portal. That's another benefit that we are able to simply, very simply, customize uh, Horizon as needed to provide for system administrators, for example, single, single console for everything instead of multiple, multiple dashboards uh, per, per each uh, purpose. So that's, uh, that's all from, 
our side. So uh, if you have uh, any question, uh, we can answer them. Yeah. Yes, please. I can, yes, so question is, um, uh, you are using open country, but you are also using Calico. Uh, I don't have slide here, probably. Uh, yeah, I don't have slide. So uh, the reason here, or how to explain it, is that uh, you have Kubernetes as underlay, and uh, Kubernetes works best with the Calico, which is just L3 routing. So it just provides network for containers which are running OpenStack control services in this case. And then you're launching on top of, in these containers, you're launching Contrail. So you can like containerize open Contrail on top of Kubernetes with Calico. So for the controllers, uh, the open container is just another app, so it needs Cassandra databases, it needs Zookeeper, and that it needs open control config, uh, control, and some other parts, so it's easy. And on Compute Node side, you will install Compute Node as a uh, Kubernetes node with Calico for delivering Libvirt and Nova Compute, and you, you, you will use host networking, host networking. So it means like that all pods, all services listening on the same uh, IP addresses as uh, Compute Node has, and you will just put their uh, kernel module for, uh, for the vRouter, and VMs are plugged into the vRouter, and libvirt and Nova Compute is plugged into the uh, Kubernetes, uh, Calico, which is distributed through the beard. We also want to offer option for customers which uh, don't need to have um, overlay in VMs, like use single Calico for Kubernetes as well as for OpenStack for both, uh, both solutions. Yeah, I have mentioned it because it, uh, I will repeat the question. Yeah, the question is how we, did we manage the the skills transformation of the administrators to the to the way of working of the of the continuous integration and how to learn them and do this way of working. Uh, well, yes, we have started with, with some with some trainings uh, um, given by by uh, by guys from TCP Cloud to uh, to to ma manage the platform. Uh, and uh, actually, it's not that big problem. Yeah, it's um, to to learn itself. Uh, use the tools like Git and uh, and Salt Stack. Uh, it's not not that challenging. Uh, the, the, it's it's couple of couple of days training and and, and some self work when when the when the guys have some space where to uh, where to do the training without uh, actually harming any production, but. Uh, but then um, the challenge is mainly in in the mindset, yeah, to really uh, in the thinking of the people to really really think of doing the changes correctly. It means usually to uh, change the configuration template if uh, if the particular parameter is, is not not yet parameterized in, in the reclass structure, for example. So that they need to start with requesting the, the template or doing themselves the template uh, change. Uh, then, then pushing the change to Git for review and not really doing these uh, these um, these changes manually uh, on the on the servers directly, just believing that um, that yeah, it's just for try and I will I will switch it back later, for example, and and not so on. But we have uh, implemented automatic procedures to check the configuration periodically so that we know that the. The, the servers are running the configuration as the configuration is prescribed in the uh, in the Git repository, which is which is uh, controlled. Yeah. Do you talk only about OpenStack uh, controllers, or also about? No, it's 
it's it's full the, no no it's not about the tenant workload yeah the tenant workload management the it's let's say as a separate server management service uh, which we offer via a standard theater uh, theater offerings yeah we got we got uh, um, um, large teams of people who are skilled in in windows linux and a lot of a lot of the application systems so they focus on the tenant workload management my talk was mainly about the infrastructure on the back end of the OpenStack and all the supportive uh, features. As I mentioned, the OpenStack is perhaps just 50% of, of all, the, all the tools we need to run all the environment. Yeah, the rest are the monitoring, logging tools, uh, software storage systems, networking, and the others. Okay. okay, so if there are not any more questions, thank you for your attention. Thank you.